Well, if you have your Bible, please turn with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. As it is the new year and we finished our series on a life pleasing to God, we begin a new uh, short series uh, this new year addressing basically our transition to Lansdale and all of the changes that will be taking place over the next few months at our church. And I thought this would be a great opportunity for us to be reminded of what we must never forget before during and even after our move in transition. And so the short series is entitled Purpose, Mission, Calling. And we want to consider each one of these three things and what it means for us as Christ's church uh, until we get ready for the move. And so each week I will just take uh, purpose, next week mission, and then the following week calling um, for us as Cornerstone and what that means to be a church that belongs to Jesus Christ. Uh, Today's sermon is entitled New Location, same purpose, worship. And so our text today is John chapter 4, verses 19 to 26, but I actually want to start reading in verse 16, just for a little more context. Uh, But this story, of course, is Jesus' encounter with a woman at the well of Samaria. And so please stand with me as your act of worship to receive God's holy word. Hear now the reading of God's word. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things, all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. And would you join me in one more prayer as we ask God's blessing upon his word. Father, truly to to stand, to read and receive your word uh, is to show our thankfulness and gratitude, but also our reverence before you, that when you speak to us, O Lord, we must listen. But apart from the Holy Spirit working in our hearts, enlightening our minds and illuminating your truth, we would not understand. So we ask you, O Holy Spirit, to be present with us and among us, giving us ears to hear and eyes to see. Father, form us and shape us through your word, for it is powerful. And have your way with us as you conform us more and more, this body, this church, into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. So now that it's the new year, the question for everybody is, what is going to be new about this new year? Maybe there'll be something new personally. Maybe you have new goals you're striving for, new habits you're committed to form. Uh, Maybe there's something new professionally you got a new job or you'll get a promotion or your responsibilities will change. Uh, Maybe there's something new in the family. Uh, Some of our families may be getting bigger and one more additional member. Maybe there are new family habits, new family routines and traditions you want to form. Well, for this family, this church family, in our church, 2019 is going to be a big year. It's going to be full of many new things. You know, we purchased a building last year, and we're finally going to move into the building on February 3rd. So it'll be a new location, and by God's grace, he will send new people, and of course, there's going to be a new worship time, and that means for you all, we're going to have to develop new Sunday rhythms, new Sunday habits, new Sunday morning waking up times. But as we anticipate all of the new things on their way, We cannot and must not lose sight of the things that are actually going to stay the same. 
You see, because change and new things are all good, but we must always keep the foundational and the central things the same. And one of those is our purpose. The purpose for why we gather together as a church. You know, February 3rd is not far off. In just a few weeks, you'll no longer be driving to Chalfont. You'll no longer take this turn into 300 High Point Drive. You'll no longer park in the same parking spot that some of you have been in for years. There's going to be a lot of changes, but, but when we walk into our new church, when we gather on that Sunday, February 3rd, here's what won't change. We will still meet for the same purpose we always have and always will, which is to worship our triune God. Worship is the purpose for which we gather. And that, friends, will never change. As we look at today's story, here's our gospel truth. Wherever we are called to gather, worship is always our purpose. Wherever we are called to gather, worship is always our purpose. And so let's begin studying this passage. Now the context of this story is that Jesus is meeting a woman at a well in Samaria. And it's important to know that the woman is a Samaritan because without knowing that, what she says in verse 20 makes absolutely no sense. The woman says to Jesus, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Now she makes this whole distinction about mountains because as a Samaritan, she worshiped on Mount Gerizim, but the Jews, they worshiped in Jerusalem. And historically, the Samaritans and the Jews, they argued and debated over who was right. You know, the day after Christmas, I flew out to Kansas City uh, to speak at a retreat. Now, do you know anything about Kansas? I only knew two things about Kansas before this trip. The first is that they are known for their barbecue. And the second is that Deacon Jong is from Kansas. <laughs> so if you're like me, it's news to you that Kansas City, there are actually two Kansas cities. There's a Kansas City, Kansas, and there's a Kansas City, Kansas City Missouri. And the two cities are completely different. I mean, they are, they're literally next to one another, but they are different cities. And what was really interesting going and talking with people and hearing from the locals is the argument that happened from those from Kansas and those from Missouri about which Kansas City was the better Kansas City. And I'm telling you, it got heated. It got emotional. People went back and forth arguing which city is better. And I'm listening to this, and the whole time I'm thinking, you know, either way you look at it, you're, talk you're from Kansas City, so you both lose. Um, <laughs> It's Kansas City. But their argument, which Kansas City is better? The Samaritans and the Jews, they argue with this kind of passion, this kind of zeal. Which is the place to worship? Jerusalem or Mount Gerizim? Now, the Jews worshiped in Jerusalem because, as many of you may know, in um, Samuel and Kings, David bought the... Um, the ground for the temple would be built, and Solomon built it, the temple in Jerusalem. And so the Jews say where we worship is in Jerusalem. But the Samaritans had their own Bible. Uh, some of you would have liked this Bible. It was only five books long. It was only the first five books of the Bible. And because they only believe and they hold to, uh, the canon of Genesis to Deuteronomy, when they learned that, oh, worship is in Jerusalem? Oh, but that's from Samuel and Kings. We don't believe in that. And so they looked at Deuteronomy, and Deuteronomy, it was on Mount Gerizim that the blessings would be poured out upon Israel. And so they said, Gerizim, this mountain is where we should worship. And so this woman brings up this ancient debate between the, the Jews and the Samaritans, and she brings it to Jesus. Because Jesus just called her out. He knows her heart. He knows her romantic love life, her past, her history. And so she perceives he's a prophet and brings to him this question to get his insight. Which question or which location is right? Where does God want us to worship? And Jesus' answer is surprising. It's surprising because he is a Jew, but his answer essentially to her is, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Listen to him in verse 21. Read with me. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. See, Jesus doesn't dismiss her question, but he just helps her to see that she's actually asking the wrong question. 
It doesn't matter where you worship, in this location or that location, in Jerusalem or Mount Gerizim, in Shalfon or Lansdale. It doesn't matter where you worship. It's a matter of how you worship. That's the bigger concern Jesus is drawing her attention to. And so he says in verse 23, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Jesus doesn't want her to be distracted by all these unnecessary questions. He wants her to be consumed with the most important thing, worship of the Father. And so Jesus, in fact, does a little word play here where the woman says in verse 20, our fathers worshiped on this mountain. And then Jesus responds, yeah, well, that's what your fathers did, but let me tell you what my father wants of you. How can Jesus say that it no longer matters? Isn't the Old Testament so specific and so meticulous and so detailed and so clear regarding issues of proper worship to Yahweh, to the Lord? So how can he say it doesn't matter? And he actually gives us the answer in verse 21 when Jesus says, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. What's, what's his answer? Because the hour is coming. In the Gospel of John, whenever Jesus refers to the hour, he is indicating the hour of his death, his sacrifice, his work on the cross, his redemption of sinners. And Jesus is saying that because I have come, because I have come, the final sacrifice, all of the priesthood, the temple, all of that is now done away with. Jesus is saying, because I have come, because I have paid and I'm going to pay the ultimate penalty for your sins by becoming the final sacrifice, I'm fulfilling it. I'm fulfilling that Old Testament. Jesus comes and he's showing himself uh, as the ultimate sympathetic one who was tempted like his people in every single way, fulfilling that he is actually the final and truest priest. He's fulfilled that portion of the Old Testament. Jesus comes as the ultimate expression by being God's very presence with us, and he fulfills the Old Testament as being the true temple. And it's because Jesus has come and he's going to fulfill the final sacrifice, the final priesthood and the final temple. He's saying, I'm getting away, I'm doing away with the need of one location, one specific place where you worship God. I'm making a way possible so that you can worship God anywhere, not bound to this letter of the law. Jesus saying, after my hour has come and I die and I resurrect and I ascend and send my spirit to you, the Holy Spirit who now dwells in you, you will be a temple and where you gather is where God is worshiped. And so Jesus' whole point is it's not about the place of worship, it's about the purpose of worship. Now, you know, here's the thing for us. You hear this. This is an incredibly freeing a wonderful truth, but when we hear it, we don't, it's hard for us to feel any excitement about this because there has not been a time you haven't had this freedom. You've always lived in the freedom of the spirit because you belong to the new covenant age that you can worship God anywhere. And so you can't remember a time that you had to when you wanted to worship, get in an airplane, go over to Israel and go to Jerusalem. None of us. But in order to appreciate this, you actually have to put yourself in her shoes and imagine what it was like to be this woman hearing what Jesus was saying for the first time and imagining how radical of a thing it actually was to hear this. It's kind of like this. You know, we live in an age where nearly everybody has a cell phone. Now, I know there's some people in here who don't have a cell phone, but, you know, out there, <laughs> nearly everyone has a cell phone. Of course, the younger ones can't imagine what life without one is like. But think back to the, to the days, or, or I guess the younger ones, what? imagine back to the days when you had a beeper, and if somebody called you, you know, you got a message, and when you got that alert, what did you have to do? You'd have to go find a pay phone. You would have to go to a place that has a pay phone. Some kids are like, what's a pay phone? You have to find a pay phone, you get to the pay phone, then you have to have the money to make the call. You see, 
Before cell phones, you had to go to a specific location. You had to go to a specific place. There was no choice. But now with cell phones, you can make a call from anywhere in the world, from out in public, from another country, from in your bathroom, from, you know, in your car on the road. Now, I know some of you have equally lived your life between, you know, only having a landline and having a a cell phone. Some of you, maybe actually more of your life has been with landlines and cell phones are still kind of new. For others of you, it's the total, it's the other way. Some of you are like, what's a landline? But if you remember that period, you know exactly the freedom, the joy, the incredible shift that took place in your life. When you held a phone for the first time and you realized that I can call anybody anywhere around the world at any time. The incredible shift that happens now that you don't get message for a beep and you have to go find a pay phone. It's that kind of shift that's happening in this woman's life, this paradigm shift for the Samaritan woman. This kind of freedom now that she's being offered, this good news Jesus is telling her, saying you're not bound by location anymore. Not only you, in fact, nobody is because of Jesus Christ. That you can come and draw near to worship God, n- neither on this mountain nor on that city, but only through Christ alone. And just like the younger generation, you know, you, you, when you tell them about a time without the cell phone, they just, they don't get it because they've always had it. I think the problem is for a lot of us, we don't understand how radical what Jesus is saying because there's, all, there's never been a time that we had to travel to a specific place to worship. But when we sit back and we think about it, we learn to appreciate what Christ did through the cross in giving us now freedom to worship God anywhere at any time. So really, whether it's Chalfont or at Lansdale or it's you know, 1 p.m. or 10.30 a.m., we can worship the Lord anywhere. There's gonna be new things, new changes in location, new changes in buildings, new changes in time. But what will not change is the purpose for which we gather, worship. So the question still remains though, how then will we worship? How then should we worship? Now as you think about this, I I really want you to take some time to honestly ask yourself this question. When you gather for worship, are you more concerned about yourself and what you're gonna get out of it? Or are you more concerned with God and what it is you can give him. As you come to gather for worship, are you more concerned with the blessings you're going to walk away with or the blessings with which you come and you offer it to God? Who is worship really for? You see, Jesus shifts our focus that way, away from ourselves and toward God. And he tells us, what the Father wants. He's saying worship is not about what you want. Let me tell you about what the Father is seeking. Let me tell you about what the Father desires from those who worship him. Because the Father is seeking something in particular. He knows what he wants. And the question is, are we giving to God what he's seeking from us on his terms or on our terms? This is the big confusion in worship, that many people think that they can worship God on their own terms, that they want to worship God according to how they want to express themselves, how they feel, what they like, what makes them feel good, what they're blessed by, what's convenient for them, what's comfortable for them, what's my style, what's my preference. But if worship is all about God, then why and how is it that people are so much more concerned with what pleases them than what pleases the Lord? You know, there's a bit of arrogance when we come to worship God and we do it how we want to. You know, I go to these retreats and revivals and I often hear praise leaders say, you know, I just want you to get comfortable. I just want you to be you. You know, if you feel like dancing, dance. If you want to come out into the aisles, go into the aisles. If you just, you know, want to go outside and just pray and look at the trees, go do that. And and this idea of like, you do what you want to do. And I don't think so. You know, there's a little bit of arrogance when you worship God as you want, not as he wants, not as he's told you to do. Do you know that? There's arrogance in there. And I'll share with you a pet peeve of mine. When I meet people for the first time, I almost introduce, always introduce myself the same way. Hi, I'm Andrew. Or hello, I'm Andrew. And so it really irks me when I've just introduced myself as Andrew, and then they take it upon themselves to call me Andy. You know, because whenever they do that, in the back of my mind, I'm just thinking to myself, why are you calling me Andy? (laughs) 
That's not how I introduced myself. If I wanted to be called Andy, I would have called myself Andy, but I called myself Andrew. So who do you think you are? <laughs> of course, if you've called me Andy, I, I never thought that about you, but <laughs> other people. But to be honest, even if I was okay with being called Andy, which I'm not, but if I was okay with that, the stranger does know I've introduced myself as Andrew. So what gives them the right then to call me what they want to call me instead of calling me what I've asked them to call me? Because they're calling me on the na a name based on their terms, not my terms. And you can imagine if I'm displeased when other people call me what they want instead of what I've asked them to, then imagine the offense against God who's telling us he's seeking people who will worship him in spirit and in truth, and then we go ahead and we approach worship however the way we want to. Now, some of you are going to walk away and think that the main point of the sermon is, man, Pastor Andrew really hates being called Andy. <laughs> That's just the secondary point. <laughs> the main point is that when we decide ourselves how to worship God, instead of listening and seeking and obeying to what he wants us to do, it's a very arrogant thing to do because worship is not about you. You see, God has told us what he cares about in our worship. Verse 23, the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Our purpose then as a church when we gather together is to worship him as he is seeking, as he desires. And this leads to this conclusion of mine. We must become a seeker-sensitive church. We must become a seeker-sensitive church. Seeker-sensitive in all that we do from the beginning of our service to the very end. Now some of you have just given me a death glare. But wait, I'm serious. Every time that we gather, there is a seeker among us. Even if there isn't a guest, even if there isn't a visitor, there is a seeker among us. In this very service, there is a seeker in this room and we must be sensitive to him. Now before you're getting alarmed, the session is already texting each other. We need to meet with him and correct him. I do not mean what you think I mean. There is a seeker among us, and he is the Lord. And he is present with us in every service, and he is seeking true worshipers who are worshiping in spirit and in truth. See, God is the seeker we should be most concerned about in every worship service. He is the seeker we must keep in mind as we plan and prepare and pray for our worship service. Every detail of our worship is done with him in mind and whether or not he will be pleased and delighted. For it says here, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. You know, this is why worship must never be dictated or determined merely out of a personal preference or even church tradition in history. To change our worship, to suit the preferences of people, and to have our aim be to give you the perfect worship experience is to make worship about you. But also to never change our worship because of church tradition, and this is how we've always done it, is also to make worship about you. But worship isn't about you, and it is about me, it's about God. Worship is like coming together to stand at the Grand Canyon of God's person and work and gaze in speechless wonder. The purpose of worship is to come to have our mouths drop and our hearts be still at the sheer magnitude of his glory and the indescribable goodness that is radiating from within him to look and stand at the unsearchable expanse of his grace and just sit still and worship. That's what worship is. Worship is not to point you at a mirror so you stand and you, begin, you look in awe and wonder at the person looking right back at you. And yet that's how many of us think about worship. You know, we were created, we were called to marvel at God and his saving grace through Jesus. So then how do we do this? 
Verse 24 says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, what does it mean to worship in spirit and truth? Now, this verse is often very uh, misunderstood. Uh, the way I grew up understanding it and the way I've heard it taught is uh, this notion that, that people think Jesus is telling us we need to blend two kinds of worship elements together, two approaches, two styles of, of, of worship together. So a lot of people associate the spirit, meaning like the charismatic approach, and then in truth is sort of the conservative approach. We all do this by default. We create these kind of two different categories and we judge and evaluate worship according to those two things. So for example, you visit a church and you describe the worship as, oh, they're very charismatic. Well, based on what? And we see that you know, they have their hands raised and they're swaying. And the music is a full band and there's a synthesizer and electric guitar and they make liberal you know, use of lights and smoke machines. And the praise leader is encouraging you, let's sing the chorus again and again, and now let's go to the bridge, and now let's go back to the chorus, and now voices only, and so on and so forth. And you leave that kind of worship, and you say, man, they really love the Holy Spirit. The worship was so spirit-led. And someone says, well, what kind of worship was it? Oh, it's very charismatic. And that's how we view it. And on the other hand, you visit another church, and you describe it as conservative, and based on what? And you say, well, I, I couldn't raise my hands in worship because I was holding a hymnal. You know, the music was an organ, organ as a piano with strings. The service was a lot of standing and sitting and standing and sitting and call and response, a lot of Old Testament reading, and what's the deal with that? And you say about the church, man, they really love the truth here. This worship is so word-led, word-centered, and you call that conservative. And often when we think about worship in spirit and truth, people say, oh, what Jesus is saying is you need to take the blend of the two that it's somehow a balance of both charismatic and conservative. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's not saying, you know, you should be spiritual here and stiff here. No, 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 no. He's actually working from the ground up, teaching us, constructing for the first time what true worship is, to worship in spirit and truth. So, so what is that? Well, first, the question, what does it mean to worship in spirit? Well, Jesus is not referring to the Holy Spirit. To worship in spirit is not referring to being led by the spirit, capital spirit. He's talking about worshiping with your spirit. Worshiping God, not just externally, but internally with all of your inward being. To be engaged with God, not just bodily and physically, but with all of your heart and all of your emotions and all of your will, centered and focused on him. You know, your body can be here present in worship but if your mind is thinking about the Eagles game at 4.40 p.m., then you are not in worship. You are in worship, but you're not in worship. You see, the thing about worshiping God is, is your spirit is not like a switch that you can just turn on and off. You know, certain outward emotions, the closing of the eyes and raising of hands, the swaying of bodies, the head nods, the amens, the, the envelope and the basket, all of these kinds of things, you could turn on and off. You know, but the heart is not like a propane gas grill that you can hit a switch and the flames suddenly appear. The heart is more like a wood fire that needs to be kindled and the embers need to be fanned into a flame. So God is seeking worshipers who worship in spirit. Are you one of those worshipers? How are you cultivating and tilling the soil of your heart to worship? And part of that, friends, is preparation. Preparation for worship. Preparation is not antithetical to being spirit-led. This is why this year I announced at the very beginning that if you look in our order of worship, we begin now with silent preparation. So you can get yourself ready to engage and commune with God as you come into his presence. This is also why we print all of this information out some of you are thinking, just save some ink and trees. But we print this out. Why? So you can get yourself ready. So you can read the call to worship. You can read the confession of sin. You can read the assurance of pardon. You can read the scripture passage so you know what's coming. So there isn't any surprise. If you know what's coming, you're ready for it. You're preparing yourself from it. How in the world can you really pray the prayer of confession when you come up here? And we read it pretty quickly. How can you really understand what you're confessing unless you've prepared and looked at it in advance? 
So this preparation is what gets us ready to worship in spirit. And I think about it like this, when you go to a restaurant, don't you look at the menu? Of course you do. How many of you sit down, the server comes over and you say, surprise me? You get the menu, what do you do? You look through it quickly. You note its sections. You look through it, you flip through it at first, you get a general sense of what they offer. Then you go back, and then you slow, slow down and you take your time. You read the items, you read the descriptions, you slow down, and then when the server comes, you're ready to order. That's how you prepare for worship. You look through the bulletin, you see what's coming up, you read through it, you pray, you meditate, you reflect. And you do this before the worship so that by the time the call to worship comes, your spirit is ready to praise and adore, and to honor, and to commune with the living God because you've prepared. The Father is seeking those who worship in spirit and truth. Are you one of those worshipers? Second, what does it mean to worship in truth? To worship in truth means to have right thoughts about God. To have before you as you're singing, as you're praying, as you're listening to the word, to have before you a clear vision of who he is and what he has done for you. Because God doesn't want you worshiping ideas about him. He wants you to worship him. And the way we know what is true about who God is and what he's done for us is when we look at the scriptures, when we look at the word of truth to see what God has revealed about himself because each of those truths is a reason to worship him. You know, here's one way to think about the Bible. Think of the Bible as God's resume or God's CV. Every chapter, every story, every book in here highlights a reason for why he is worthy to receive praise, honor, and glory. Read the scripture in that way. From Genesis to Revelation, It's just reasons why you should worship God. The Old Testament gives us reasons to worship God. God's power in creation. God's promise to defeat the serpent. God's Passover lamb to save. God's provision of the sacrificial system. God's pattern of redeeming love. God's prophecy of sending his son. All those reasons to worship. You turn to the New Testament, gives us reasons to worship. God's presence with his people. God's propitiation through his blood. God's perfect righteousness for you and me. God's protection from the evil one. God's plan to work all things for your good. God's purpose to restore the world. You open the Bible, this word of truth, it tells you every reason you have to come and to adore and behold our God. So then to worship in truth means that everything we do in our service and every worship that we bring to him is from the Bible and informed by the Bible. It means the songs that we sing are in line with the Bible's truth. It means the prayers we pray are responding to the Bible's truth. It means the sermons are based and preached from the Bible's truth. It means the order of worship is formed and informed by the Bible's truth. And the more we have truth, the word of God, the truth of God invade our service, the more accurately we begin to see God, the more worship is stirred in our hearts, the more glory that we give to him for who he is and what he has done. To have truth not invade, to take truth out, is to blur God and is to twist our worship and lessen it. This is what it means to worship God in truth. So are you this kind of worshiper? When we gather together, our purpose is clear, Cornerstone. When we gather, we come because God is seeking worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, that's the thing. Our purpose is clear, but is our motivation clear? Why must this be my unchanging purpose? What about when I don't feel like worshiping? Well then let me remind you of this truth. Before God was ever seeking you as a worshiper, he was seeking you as a lost sheep. You see, Jesus sought this woman at the well at the hottest hour of the day. Jesus sought after Zacchaeus, and then in his home he declared the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus sought the world by coming as a long-awaited Messiah, so he says in verse 26, I who speak to you am he. Jesus did not seek you first to get your worship. 
He sought you first in order to save you from your sins. He did not come to you for what you could do for him, but he came to, do, to you for what he could do for you. You see, before God ever wanted your worship, he wanted you. He just wanted you. And when you begin to realize that Jesus sought me as a sinner first, Jesus sought me to die for me and forgive my sins, when the magnitude of this good news pierces your heart, it actually transforms you into a worshiper. It makes you into a worshiper. The gospel of God's grace takes sinners and turns them into worshipers. Because you can sit here and think, God is a little selfish, isn't he? He's just seeking worshipers. He's just seeking glory. He's just seeking honor. Well, no, friends, before he ever sought that, he was seeking you. And he found you. And it took him to the cross where he died for your sins and was raised for your justification. The question really is, has the gospel made this kind of impact in your life? My prayer is as, as the gospel begins to take root deeper and deeper into our church and into your lives personally, that together we are being formed more and more, changed, transformed more and more into this kind of worshiper. And when this is true, wherever we gather, whether it's in this building or in that building, in this town or that town, in this hour or that hour, that whenever we gather, worship will always be the purpose. And that when God is seeking now worshipers, he will find it here at Cornerstone. Let us pray. Father, we are thankful to know that you sought us first. And that seeking, that searching was planned in intention before the foundations of the earth. And Jesus, in the fullness of time, you came for us and you gave your life so that we who were lost and weary and em empty and frustrated and lonely, so far from you, so separated from you, in fact, on a completely separate road headed toward an eternity of punishment for our sin, that you would seek after us and save us and take our punishment, die the death we should have died, that you live the life that we should have lived. And now you offer to us forgiveness and eternal life and reconciliation. And we pray, Lord, as we really understand all that you did for us, that it would not just be one of many reasons we should worship you, it should just transform us into worshipers. For the gospel has that kind of power. Lord, now as we approach your table, I pray, O oh Lord, that you would grant to us continual hearts of gratitude and thankfulness for now we get to see not just hear in word form but see with our very eyes and taste with our mouths and touch with our hands as we remember the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ in his name we pray Amen Saints, lift up your eyes lift up your hands and receive the benediction Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father Almighty and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all both now and forevermore. Amen. Hear the words of dismissal. Let us go forth to serve the world as those who love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Go in peace, my friends.